All right, so uh, Adam, if you could tell us a little about yourself, you know, where you come from and kind of where you got to where you are now. Sure, sure. So I'm 5'7", blonde hair, blue <laughs> eyes, love pizza. Awesome. My favorite animal is a dogfish. No, I'm only kidding. So I, I've been doing IT uh, and IT-related stuff for over 30 years. Uh, and, you know, I kind of fell into it, actually, because I didn't plan on doing this and didn't go to school back in the day when I went to school. I studied to be an international relations uh, analyst. That's what I went to school to learn how to do, political science, IR. I uh, was thinking about going into maybe doing environmental law. You couldn't go to school to do the kind of stuff that we do now. And so I just started out like a lot of people roughly of my age did, kind of learning on my own and uh, fell into it just because I had a passion for computers and a passion for teaching. And so I've been teaching for over 30 years as well. So what was like the, the first job that kind of that led you into the field, if you would, you know? Um, so it wasn't so much a job. Um, it was really just the fact that I, as I went to school, as I was sharing with you, when I went to college uh, and started out, got my first degree, I got a degree in international relations, political science. And I've always had a background and an interest with learning and training, things like that. But I use technology to do what I do. You know, back when I went to school in college, you used typewriters. You didn't have uh, computers. Word processors weren't even invented <laughs> back then. So uh, you didn't really see a word processor, let alone a computer or something that we would think of today like a laptop or a tablet until I was already almost in graduate school. So it wasn't so much that I, I was like, oh, God, I got to go do this. And, oh, I want to study IT or I want to do security, all the things I do now. Uh, it was really more just always a hobby of mine. I built my own computer, a TRS-80. We used to call them Trash 80s, a Radio Shack <laughs> kit back when I was, you know, very... Uh, back in the early 80s, you know, when I was just starting out. And, and you know, I just kind of had a passion for it. But how I fell into it specifically was that I had graduated and I made the startlingly great career choice in college and in graduate school of uh, not only being focused on IR and poli-sci, but actually being a Sovietologist. I went to school to learn how to study the Soviet Union and to be a policy analyst, wanted to work at the UN and do that and teach. That's what I was going to do. And graduated right before the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And so I was out of work pretty much the minute I got out of school. I couldn't, nothing yep. for me to do. Although now with Putin, I'm, yeah. Putin, I'm gonna be making a comeback. <laughs> yeah, right. I actually have great job prospects if he stays in office. So as a result, I, I kind of had to look around and figure out what I was gonna do because what I studied was essentially no longer necessary, at least not the way I'd studied, not what I wanted to do. And I'd always had a passion for computers, always had a passion for teaching, I taught uh, as a teaching assistant and a graduate assistant in school when I was in college. And I thought, well, you know, I can pretty much teach and I'm, I'm good at it. And I could teach probably just about anything if I know it well enough. And so I started looking for jobs, maybe thinking I'd do a little teaching. And one thing kind of led to another. And I found this company called New Horizons, which at the time nobody had really heard of. Mm -hmm. Wasn't the big kind of huge company it is today. You know, one of the biggest uh, computer training companies in the world. And they were looking to open up their offices in uh, South Florida, where I am from, where I live. And one thing led to another, went in for an interview, and 20 years later, just recently left them not too long ago formally. Uh, and I spent 20 years working for them, running uh, technology as the CTO, the CIO, and as a lead trainer and uh, subject matter expert, uh, engineer, if you will, for the South Florida and Caribbean locations, for the gentleman who owns the franchises down there. Uh, and I spent 20 years as a consultant, work, you know, working and uh, training all over the world before I started working for IT Pro TV. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. So uh, one thing, I kind of I was doing like a live stream on my YouTube channel uh, just mm -hmm. yesterday, and I was kind of giving everybody like a like not like a warning, but you know, kind of saying, "Hey, I'm going to be interviewing Adam from IT Pro TV," and cool. you know, we pulled cool. up your profile and everything, and then everybody was like. How many certifications does this guy have? And I'm like, yeah, he, just a few, just, just a, few, a few, right? So it's like what, 170 or something plus. So it, a lot. It, it's a, a large lot. number. It's a large I, number. I, it's big. Let's put it that way. It is over, well over 100. It's probably somewhere around that, approximately. But to put that in perspective for you, and and certainly probably a lot of the people that are going to listen to the podcast and and may want to know how do you get that crazy number, and more importantly, why would you? Right? It's <laughs> kind of ridiculous. Um, but yeah, that's over a 30 plus year career in IT, number one, first of all, to, to give everybody a perspective. Number two, um, 
you know, people ask me about that all the time, you know, because I've written books and done a lot of different things. And it's kind of the standard bio line. Look, you know, he's got this many certifications, but the majority of them, while they were important at some point in time, relevant for customer engagement, relevant for a consulting solution I was involved with, or perhaps a customer requirement, or even just to practice my craft. Uh, I've been a Microsoft certified trainer for close to 20 years now, probably even maybe 20 years. Um, I've been CISSB certified for, for many, many years, those kind of things. So there are many certifications that I held at one point that may no longer be relevant. And although they're there, they're essentially retired and gone. I'm certified, for instance, on um, uh, Microsoft, going all the way back to NT35 and 351, yeah. back to Windows 95. Wow, yeah. Some of the very first certifications yeah. Microsoft put in market, can't get those anymore. They haven't been relevant for a long time, uh, but I, I do have them. So when you look at that number, it's kind of an all up number over a very long career. I may use 10 to 15 of those that are current that I keep up with on a regular basis, my security credentials, my infrastructure credentials, VMware, Microsoft, et cetera, across those stacks that I consult and work in on a regular basis. Right, so, yeah. I mean, that's awesome. I mean, that it's impressive and it's really, you know, I, we, I think all like really just are extremely impressed by that for one, but. It's um, what happens when you have a lot of time on your hands, somebody says to you, Hey, we'll pay for you to go learn that stuff. It's cool. Yeah. And you say, wow, that's awesome. Because I have a passion for teaching. I have a passion for learning, as I'm sure you do and many of the people that probably watch podcasts like yours and like this about IT in general and watch IT Pro TV do. Uh, and when somebody says to me, or you, essentially, here's a blank check, go play, yeah. can't keep me away, right? I mean, yeah. I'll go oh, take yeah. full advantage of it. And yeah, that's the, the great thing about what I do for a living and what a lot of IT professionals get to do if their companies are great with benefits and yeah. you know really help them to do those things is you get to take advantage of those opportunities and learn about things you may never see otherwise and do otherwise. Oh yeah, absolutely, 100%. Um, so they, the, you know, people in the live stream, they had a couple questions and I'm sure you've got these questions before, right? But if you had to, could you name all of the certifications that you have? So I, I could you don't do have a to. pretty, you don't sure, have to sure, right sure. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't subject you or anybody <laughs> yeah. else to that. It's very dull and boring. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I, I could probably do a decent job. I don't think I could name all of them, but I could get pretty close. Okay. That, yeah. That's awesome. I'm um, not that old yet that I've forgotten the majority <laughs> of what I've done, uh, but, but I'm getting well, close to that point. I mean, with that many, I don't know how anybody could, <laughs> could remember even a young person, you know, like that's just, that's a, so many. Um, it is. Which one? Which one's your favorite? You know, if you had to pick through the bunch, you know, like wh which one would be like your your favorite go to kind of? This was your favorite one to study, um, and the the one that you're most proud of. You know. Sure, it's a great question. And so uh, I'll I'll give you the politically correct answer, <laughs> and then I'll give you the honest answer. Okay. So the politically correct answer is I have kids, as as many of the people that are listening and are watching may. And so you never have a favorite when you have children, right? Because obviously you want to share the love equally and everything is equally important and you want to make sure you, you let everyone know that everything is important. So that's my politically correct right. answer. But having said that, um, you know, there are some that are near and dear to my heart for some of the reasons you mentioned. Did I really work at it to get it? Was it a challenge? Did I have to push myself? Or was there something special and unique about it? And as a result, it stands out in my mind. And so for me, I think there are, by category, it's probably the best way to answer it. I do a lot of security work. It's one of the areas I specialize in. I do a lot of infrastructure and cloud work, areas that are near and dear to my heart. In the security area, because of my background, my experience, and also my very large amount of time commitment with organizations like ASACA and ISC2, CISSP certainly being the flagship credential for ISC squared, and CISA, CISM, et cetera, with ASACA, I hold most of the certifications from both of those certification bodies and have for a long time. I think I'm most proud of my CISSP and CISA credentials uh, in those areas because of the amount of time and effort I had to put in to get there yeah. and the amount of teaching and training and consulting that I've done over the many years, the decades that I've held uh, in some cases one or both of those and the number of students that I've helped to actually get certified. I've helped a lot of people get their CISSP credential uh, and, and done the same thing on the CISA side. And I think those are really important for me, benchmarks about how I measure the value of a certification. Mm -hmm. um, in infrastructure and in cloud in particular, I, I've worked with VMware for a long time and Microsoft. I dabble, uh, if you will, in both stacks. I'm a certified trainer 
an MCT and a certified VCI, a VMware certified instructor. I have been for a number of years. And I think getting my VCI status and being a certified instructor for VMware and working with them and for them in the field the way I've done for both with customers has really been for me a big accomplishment. It was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever done, believe it or not, is becoming a VMware certified instructor. It's wow. very, very difficult to do. Uh, and it requires a lot of time and dedication to maintain. Wow. So, yeah. That's great. Perfect. So hmm? with the, if, if you had to pick one area of the field to work in, it would probably be security, I'm guessing. That would be, like if you, did, if you weren't like in, in edutainment, you know, if you weren't going to be a teacher, like if that was just out of the question, would, would security be like the, the field that you gravitate towards? Starbucks barista. That, that's, that would be me <laughs> right there. Oh, if man. I couldn't do what I do for a living, my next greatest passion is espresso. So I would be in the coffee world. But um, seriously, what I would do, it's a great question. You know, I, I haven't really thought about it that way. But I think about it sometimes and say, you know, if I wasn't fortunate enough to be able to, to do teaching as a large component of what I do, because it's not the only thing I do. I spend a lot of time with customers in the field working on solutions. But if I wasn't doing this exclusively or almost exclusively, it would be a combination of security and infrastructure. I don't think it would be one or the other because I think you can't really do one well without the other. Right. I think you could be great at administration, but if you don't understand how to secure and really validate what you're doing through control and assessment and risk and governance and compliance, you're not really doing your job or your customer the service that they expect. And I think the same can be true on the security side. If you really are good at security and risk mitigation and control, but you don't have an understanding of the technologies you're controlling, it's very hard to validate that you're doing them in a way that makes sense. And balancing those, I think, is the critical, for me, has been historically my career, the critical success factor that I try to strive for. So I think I would be doing both, but just in a different way. Right. Awesome. Yeah. You know, with, with kind of what you said, I, I always get asked, you know, like, I, how do I get into security, you know, or let's say, I just want to go into security, that's all that I want to do, you know. Um, I'm just going to go take my security plus or, you know, whatnot. And I'm like, well, no, I mean, you kind of need to get some of your fundamentals like out of the way to really understand what it's going to take to to get to that security point in your career. You know, uh, you do. And, and I feel like a lot of people uh, don't necessarily understand that, which is completely, you know, I mean, I understand that because they're completely new to this field and they're looking for advice. But um, do you run across that a lot where people just think like, you know, security is its own, its own separate thing. Uh, like entity in a way, and you don't need to know uh, like infrastructure, for instance, or you don't need to know something about networking, for instance. You know, I, I to me, it's like you should really have some of these fundamentals down before you understand what it takes to be certified in anywhere security to uh, to, you, to really understand how you're going to secure an environment or. So absolutely, you know, I have this conversation a lot with students. I have it with customers as they're asking me not only to maybe be an on-call resource, but quite often as part of the consulting or the project work we do, integrate knowledge transfer, generically training, right, back to their teams and help them better understand what we're doing and how to carry it forward. And I spend a lot of time in boardrooms and a lot of time at the C-level talking with business leaders about why it's important to do things the right way as opposed to doing them uh, perhaps the quickest but not always the, the most uh, appropriate way. And I think that you know, we both hit it right on the head. I think you you expounded on what I said and, and really gave it some context, right, in, in your description. But I, I don't think, and I firmly believe, that if you're only doing one of the mosaic of pieces that go into creating a solution, whether you're the on-call resource, you're the point person in the company, however you view yourself, whatever you do, you're not doing your job and exercising Two very important elements of what we talk about in risk management and mitigation all the time, which is due care and due diligence. And if you're not able to exercise oversight and really understand how to leverage the team around you to bring in the resources necessary to do the right things at the right time, you're not a good leader. I don't claim to be an expert in, in everything, quite far from it. I'm the first one to tell you I'm bad at a lot of things and you don't want me being the point person for that. But I'm very good at understanding my limitations. And I'm equally good at finding people that are experts at what I need to be successful in a project and bringing them together so that we can then collaborate. And I think the biggest mistake people starting out in our industry tend to make is that they drink the Kool-Aid, right, proverbially. They believe that they have to become these know-all, do-all, be-all experts in one deep area and that that's enough to make them successful, like you were talking about, instead of the broader 
what I prefer to think of as the Renaissance person, right? The, the prototypical Leonardo da Vinci or, or you know, Michelangelo uh, of their day, the Renaissance man or the Renaissance person who you know, essentially knew a lot about a lot of things and was expert at many of them, but also understood their limitations and didn't try to do things that didn't make sense, but were always pushing the boundary and the envelope in areas that they could. I love to play with new technologies. I love to figure out problems that solutions can be acquired for, but I also understand the realistic limitations of my knowledge base. And I think if you're able to do that and partner effectively, you become such a valuable resource to your organization and to yourself. Yeah. But I think mentoring plays a part in that. And I think partnering and collaboration with others in your ecosystem, right, plays a part in that. And I think podcasts like yours, solutions like IT Pro TV help you to grow, but you have to be a lifelong learner in yep. order to be successful. You know, you can't just say, plant my flag, I'm done. I've captured that knowledge. There's nothing else I need to know. I am that expert. People that tell me they're expert at something and they have nothing left to learn are people I enjoy talking to, but they're not people I consider to be great resources for me because they've closed themselves off to understanding what's happening next. Right. And you can't learn if you're not willing to understand what's coming next. Yeah, that's one big thing that I constantly push uh, when people you know, always ask me, what do I need to know going into the field or what should I really pay attention to or you know, what are some of the most important things to know? You know I'm like, you always need to be learning. You, you pretty much can never stop because if you, if you stop learning in this field, you're just going to get left behind. You know, you, you oh, literally get move left so in quickly. the dust. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, I've, I've never left school. I mean, I'm so fortunate. I mean, I really am truly, in many respects, blessed in what I've gotten to do in my professional career. Yeah, you know, I had the, the bumpy start, as we talked about, where I studied this thing and pff, it's gone, <laughs> right? Go talk about the Soviet Union, it doesn't exist anymore. And that wasn't a big deal. It was just something I had to figure out. But I really, if I look back over my career, I've never been out of school in the sense that I've never stopped learning. I never really stopped being associated with learning my entire adult life. And as a result, while, yeah, I have all those crazy credentials and uh, all that stuff, I get to wake up every day and go to work doing things that I love and I'm passionate about, and I get to learn about new things every day. Right. I mean, how many people out there get to say that and are excited about yeah. the fact that they get to do that? That's yeah. why I love what I do. Yep. And you, you've you dropped this word a, a few times already since we've started talking, that's passion. And that's one big thing that I've, I've hit on so many times uh, doing videos and stuff like that. And say, you know, I feel like you have to have a strong passion for this field because the amount of learning that you have to do and, and growing that you need to do to, to stay relevant in this field, you know. So I'm glad that you kind of hit on that. You know, a lot of people don't don't really understand that in, in some ways. But, you know, it's when I think some people, they have this great idea that you can make a ton of money working in, in IT and it's really easy to do. And this is the perception that people get or, you know, have, and especially when they're coming to me. And I'm like, well, sure, it's possible, but you really need to have a passion for this. Otherwise, it's not going to be something that you enjoy or you love. You're just going to you're going to go to work every day hating it, and and you'll you won't learn new things. You'll you'll just kind of mm -hmm. stick to one thing, kind of like what you said before. You'll stick to that one area, and that's it. You know, uh, I don't know if you want to yeah. expand on that at all, but I mean, I feel like that's just one thing that really is, is a driving force in this field is is passion. For, for people who it, really want to go further, much like you and much is. like the, the, all the hosts at IT Pro TV. I mean, it's kind of been like this. Uh, everybody's it it is a consistent it. theme. Yep. There's no doubt about it. The, the people I'm, I'm fortunate to work with and work for both in, in other areas of my career and certainly here at IT Pro TV uh, all have that as a hallmark of what we do and how we approach doing what we do. Uh, I know you've interviewed Ronnie and spoke with him at length. Great. Uh, story about where he comes from, his background, how he had no connection IT to speak of, and was working a, you know essentially as a as a mechanic, mm -hmm. and uh, you know found his calling and his passion and has turned it into a phenomenal career and has helped who knows how many countless hundreds maybe thousands of people uh, figure out how to certify Cherokee who you've interviewed as well Daniel who you've interviewed I know you've spent time with all of them all of them have those stories where they came from areas and are passionate about what they do and. You know, I think over the many years, the decades for me, because I'm a little long in the tooth and gray in the hair, but for me, the long amount of time I spent both teaching and, and as I said, doing this, you know, I find that, especially when I had kids and I have two lovely, uh, you know, uh, daughters, um, and, you know, when I had kids and really went through and, and talked about 
um, you know, how to, how to see them into adulthood as they grow up and the things that I think about and what you have to do as a parent. You know, I realized, I mean, it really made me stop and think that the thing we miss out on as adults if we're not careful with regards to passion and how we get interested in stuff is really this, this beautiful thing kids do, but we get beaten out of us as we go through education systems and become adults and we stop doing, which is, you know, kids, when you watch them interact with the world, they always ask why. Right? Why does that happen? Why is that? And especially when they're young, if you've had kids and, and you're a parent and you're in, involved with them, that's all you do is spend time answering questions. Why this? Why that? I have three and of them. And as, as we mature, we tend to stop that for a variety of reasons, right? And I think it's the most unfortunate thing in the world because I think when you ask why every day, you discover your passion and you always reinvent yourself around that passion to figure out how to engage with it. And I think that's probably the most critical thing you can do not just in IT, not just for what right. we do, but for, for anybody doing anything, right? Mm -hmm. Without sounding off the deep end corny about self-help and all that kind of crazy stuff, because that's not me. But generically, I, I just think it's, it's the things we do and the questions we ask of those around us and how we engage with our surroundings that drive us to be passionate. And I, you know, I try to remember that every day. Some days I'm better at it than others, obviously. But I have the ability, because of what I do for a living, to ask that question of myself and challenge others through the shows we produce at IT Pro TV every day to do the same thing. And that keeps me engaged and focused on my passion. So for me, it's great. Yeah, that's perfect. That's, uh, yeah. that's like the perfect answer. Like the, the, I hope uh, a lot of people like see this and listen to that and really take that to heart, truly. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. I guess with kind of where you were at, with, without the, the passion part, without the continuing to learn, you know, if there was any advice that you could give somebody who was looking to get into this field, you know, what would you, what would you tell them? So great question. Um, you know, so I think I would probably tell them three things. The first one is, as we both talked about from slightly different perspectives, right? Seat belt up, strap in, boots on, eyes wide open. It's going to be a bumpy ride, right? Because you're going to devote a tremendous amount of time and energy to getting up those initial slopes as you climb the, you know, the uh, mountain of your career, so to speak, especially if you're starting new, right? You have a lot of knowledge to acquire. And you've really got to aggregate that and synthesize that into things that you could then apply. And it's very frustrating in the beginning because as we were talking about, you got to know networking, you got to know servers, you got to know storage, you got to know all those things. And it can seem daunting and overwhelming. How can I possibly learn all that stuff? How do these crazy people do what they do, right? I've been told, I can earn a lot of money and that I can do this, but it seems just so overwhelming and daunting. Don't get discouraged, right? You can do it, and it is possible. Remember you know, the old adage about how you eat the elephant, right? One bite at a time. And what I see time and again in my classes and over all the years I've been teaching uh, is that students come in wide-eyed, but not understanding the fire hose uh, and the overwhelming amount of information that they're about to subject themselves to. If you could get past that and not be overwhelmed by it, you will find success and you will be able to persevere. So first thing is don't get overwhelmed. Have the right perspective, the right context around what you're looking to accomplish. As corny as it sounds, right, because you hear it all the time, I think of it as a 30, 60, 90 plan. You hear that in sales, a lot of things like that. But create manageable goals. So what am I going to learn this week? What exam am I going to take, prepare for, pass, and, and then move on within the next 30, 60, or 90 days? What skills do I want to acquire for this project? What projects do I want to be involved in? You can kind of ramp that out to anything you do, but have manageable goals that are realistic because saying I want to be a VCP, a VMware Certified Professional in Data Center Virtualization, so I want to get my VCP on you know, uh, ESXi and Data Center is great, but saying I want to do that sometime in the next three months is better, and saying here's my plan in order to figure out how I'm going to get there is best. Right. And so create the roadmap and then execute on it relentlessly, regardless of what's in your way. So that's number one. Number two, I would say, you know, don't follow others just because you think what they did is cool. And what I mean by that is, you know, you're your own person, right? We all have to be. I didn't start out doing this because I thought 30 years from the time I sat down and said, I'd like to teach and maybe I'll teach IT and security. I'll be sitting in a chair talking with you and I'll be on a podcast talking about all the cool stuff I got to do over 30 years. It's not what I did. It's never what I envisioned. I love the opportunity to spend time doing this kind of stuff. It's great. It's really cool. It's fun to talk and it's great to talk to people about my experience, but it's not something I ever planned to do. But what I did plan 
was that I wanted to learn about new and exciting things like we talked about. And as I looked for role models in our industry and in our vertical around what I could accomplish, I saw a lot of interesting people doing a lot of really cool things, but I didn't see people doing the kind of things that I thought I wanted to do. I saw people doing some things, and then I saw people doing other things. I didn't see anybody like me, in other words, that I can emulate exclusively. I saw lots of people that had traits and visions of aspects of what I wanted to be. Don't be afraid to cherry pick your future. Pick and choose those things you see people doing that are of interest to you, but make sure they're attainable and achievable for reason number one. Right. Create the roadmaps, persevere, and really plan out where you want to be and what you want to do. And then I think the third thing is, you know, at the end of the day, regardless of what you focus on, getting started is the hardest inertia to overcome. And if you have these grand visions, it's really difficult to begin. And, you know, without, again, being too corny and too, um, you know, thought-provoking, you know, Confucius, you often hear this quote quoted, but I'll spin it a different way. Confucius said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with but one step. I prefer to think of it as the Wizard of Oz analogy, right? Because I remember growing up as a kid, uh, watching the Wizard of Oz, wide-eyed and, you know, kind of really just enthralled by it. And I remember the scene where Dorothy winds up in the center of, you know, the Munchkin area of the town, right, as she falls out of the sky, crashes on the Wicked Witch. Spoiler alert for all of you that haven't seen it, she kills the Wicked Witch, right? And so... You know, I remember seeing that. I remember her opening the door, going from black and white to color, how awesome that was. And then they do the whole dance and the song bit in there. And they dance her around. And, oh, you've got to go see the wizard. And, you know, that whole thing. And then she finds the yellow brick road. And the yellow brick road, if you remember in the, in the movie, is the spiral that starts out as a single point and through the town square spirals around and ultimately winds up becoming this grand yellow brick avenue that takes her towards ultimately the Emerald City and the rest of her journey. And I, all, I always think about my journey and where I started out from and how I have made those decisions like that as I look back on it. I didn't start out planning to be in the Emerald City. I started out planning what was I going to do to take my first step and how I would be successful along the way. And, and you know, from my perspective, I, I think it's really important to be able to do that and compartmentalize your journey. You have to have the grand vision, the long-term vision to strive for, but you can't let that distract you from what you're going to do to get started, or you never start, because you sit there pondering, going, hmm, it's a long way away. I'm not sure I can do that. Do I have enough water? How many energy bars do I need, right? And, you know, you're never going to actually make the journey. I mean, think about it. How many of us would go down the road if we knew the flying monkeys were there waiting for us, right, right. to use the, the continued analogy there? So I think you got to really be focused on the immediacy and let the long-term vision kind of develop itself over time. And if you do that, I think, I think you make it work. Yeah, that's some of the best advice right there. I mean, truly, that's that's great. Uh, that's definitely awesome advice, man. Seriously, <laughs> I love it. What area of technology uh, do you think is going to be the most important to pay attention to? You know, going forward. Sure. So um, I'm not in the crystal ball business. Unfortunately, if I was, I'd be doing something very different for right. a living, mm -hmm. as I'm sure many people would be. Right. So it's it's I think. It's a great question, but I think it's very misleading, and I'll tell you why. And I'll, I'll be happy to give you a straightforward sure. answer oh, yeah. to it as well, but I just I think it's very disingenuous. Not the, that the person or people that asked it are being disingenuous, quite the opposite. I know they probably legitimately want to know, and they are curious. I just think it's a very difficult question to answer in a genuine way, because at best I could give you my insight and potentially my guess, and that's really all it will be. But I can't really tell you because I don't know what's coming in the future, right? I can tell you in the next three to six months, maybe nine months, what I think is really critical to focus on in the technology space with regards to infrastructure. I think I can tell you with the broader 18, excuse me, 18 to maybe 24, 36 month level with regards to controls and frameworks and security and risk management, what I think the critical touchstones are in those areas because they don't tend to change as much. But could I tell you that technology X, Y, one, two, three is going to be hot in a year, and as a result, you should be positioned to take advantage of it? Anybody who tells you that is just unfortunately right. pulling your leg or guessing or trying to make themselves out to be something better than they are. Not because there aren't pundits and visionaries out there that can do those things, but very few of us are so connected to the technology stacks we work in that we understand the, the development that goes on behind the scenes to launch the next big thing and to see it as it's emerging. I think those are the people you pay attention to and those are the people you get that from. I, 
first, you know, will be the first one to tell you I'm not one of those people in the sense I don't work for a single company working deeply in one silo developing those solutions. I see them like all of us do as they emerge in the market, and then I have the opportunity to explain them to people. But having said that, my straightforward answer is I think it would be a no-brainer to tell people that virtualization and cloud are going to continue to be the thing that is just going to change and transform the way we work uh, and has for about three to five years now. But I think what builds on that is really where I am interested in spending time going forward, which is the ability to be able to understand analytics and visualization around data and how artificial intelligence and those streams are coming together. I think AI for all the crazy, wacky, spooky, matrix-like overlays that come with that conversation, I think if you strip away all the human concern and just the, the hype around AI, I think it's interesting. I don't know that it's necessary, and I'm not sure that it's something we want to go and ultimately pursue hardcore the way some people are suggesting. I, I have my doubts, like many do. But I do think that the work that's being done in, in analytics and data visualization and business intelligence, especially as we see data sets continuing to just blossom. I mean, we went from a data mart and a data cube to a data farm to a data sea, a data lake, and now a data ocean. I, I don't know what's next, a data planet. I mean, these are all legitimate terms, right, that yeah. talk about big data. And, and as data continues to scale, I think if we don't understand how to analyze, slice, dice, and, and interpret it, uh, we're going to essentially just be overwhelmed and consumed by it. And we already see it. I see it all around me every day. So I, I think those are the areas that I'm really interested in spending time on. And I think those are areas of growth. I mean, look at machine learning and data science. Yeah. Those are the huge focal points around STEM today. You want to position yourself to be successful with a career that's exciting, challenging, and engaging, and that's going to really rock people's worlds and change humanity for the better. Learn how to figure out data science and machine learning and contribute to the betterment of the world because that's where the future is. Right. That's perfect. Yeah. And that's just it definitely like a a broad question for sure, you know, because mm -hmm. nobody can predict the future, of course, and technology grows at such a fast pace that, you know, it, it, who knows, like you said, who knows what's going to happen, you know, months from now, it could just go completely sideways for all we know. It so. could, we may be back to stones and sticks, it's hard to say for sure. <laughs> yeah. I hope not, I, gosh, I yeah. hope not, but yeah, no, that's perfect, perfect answer, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. No, no big deal. So let me let me throw a question at you for a change, if you don't mind. I don't know if oh, your that's other funny. interviewees had this opportunity, but I'm going to grab the proverbial mic for a minute. So while you're trying to figure out maybe what sure. you want to ask next, if we want to do one or two more, and I'm fine with that, as many as you want to do. But let me let me turn this around for a minute and ask you something, because I'm curious. You and I haven't ever met in person. I, I know a lot about you based on your connection with IT Pro TV and mm -hmm. the work you've done interviewing. As we talked about many of my co-hosts and SMEs here. But you and I haven't actually ever met and had the opportunity to spend time talking, and I look forward to doing that. I know you're going to come visit us in a few weeks, yep. and uh, hopefully I'll get to meet you in person when you're here. Uh, but maybe if you could answer for me quickly, aside from the obvious, which is, you know, hey, how do you pick the people you're going to interview? Well, I see people that are of interest, and I try to find out if they're available. So I, I get that, pr that part of the process. But when I ask the question, how do you pick people that you want to put on your podcast, what I want you to, to help me to better understand about it is, what do you think makes an interesting person you want to interview? So what are you looking for when you ask somebody like me to come on and, and spend time chatting with you and all your viewers and listeners? What makes a good person sitting in the scene answering questions for you? What do you look for? Uh, so, well, for you guys, it's it's completely different, I feel like, from other people that I've interviewed. And I can, mm -hmm. I can go on that a little bit. But, you know, with, with IT Pro TV, so everybody that I've met there so far has a completely different attitude about the field. Um, from most people, you know, most people that I've worked with or just had relations with in the past, they share the same feelings that I do. You know, they're very passionate about it. They're there to help people and they make that very, very apparent. So for me, it was like a no brainer, you know, it's like, I want to, I want to interview like every single person I can at IT Pro TV because they all are there to help people. They all really share that, that same passion. They have just this vast amount of knowledge that, that I don't have, you know, in, in all these different areas. So for me, you know, interviewing like you or, um, you know, Wes or Daniel, you know, whoever, it's, it's, it's getting everybody to kind of 
not necessarily agree with me in a way, but share that same kind of, here's, here's kind of the field, you know, here's what you need to know about it. And here's, here's this, this whole, whole passion behind it, if that makes sense, you know, and, and knowing that, um, you know, you always kind of have to be learning and, and, and I really like knowing like your guys have passed and things like that. So, um, again, and I talk about you guys all the time. So everybody is already aware, you know, pretty much about like everybody at IT Pro TV. So, you know, having you guys come on and, and really just ask some of these just different questions, it, I think it really gives a lot of uh, validity to, to what I'm saying, because you guys actually say a lot of the same stuff that I do. It's like, I don't even have to, you know, sometimes I feel like I don't even have to do like a video on things because you guys literally answer the, the question that I give you the same way that I would answer it. So, I mean, it's like perfect, you know? Appreciate you the, sharing. That's pretty cool. Does that make sense, I guess? Is that what it you're, does. Is that what you're looking curious. for? Yeah, I was just curious. Okay. Just wanted yeah. to know. No, but Very I, cool. Yeah, but, and other people, you know, other people that I interview, like, they're experts in other areas that, that I'm not. So, um, you know, I'm looking for somebody that, you know, is, you know, going to be a SME in their specific area that can share knowledge about, a little bit about that area. And then I'm, I'm definitely looking for, for people who have that same kind of passion and feeling that I do. You know, that's really the type of people that I look for. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard for me to interview people who aren't of that same, you know, um, you know, that they don't have the, those same feelings, you know, because I feel like it comes across, you know, and I don't, okay. I don't want people to have, get like the wrong feeling about this field, you know, and sure. I, I guess that the, makes sense. there's a lot of other makes people sense. in my space, my area, like on YouTube and stuff that a little bit negative, you know, and it's like, this is, this is a great field and there's lots of great people working in this field. And let me bring in all the other people that can tell you how great it is. You know, it's a noble pursuit and certainly a very, uh, very valuable thing that you do. So I appreciate the time and the opportunity to spend time yeah. talking with you about it. No, it's really I, cool. I appreciate, I appreciate you inviting me on. No, I appreciate you coming on, you know, this, I mean, yeah. I'm here to help people and that's, you know, I'm not, I'm no expert by any means. So, you know, like I said, that's why I try to bring in the real experts, the real pros, the real IT pros. Who, who would you say is the, the most influential person in your life? Just a little bit off the wall Most question. influential person in my life. So, great question. Um, I think that it was um, my uh, grandfather on my mother's side uh, would, would be the person I would say was most influential for me. Um, and continues to be, although he, he passed away a few years ago, but sorry. definitely on the personal side, I, I think professionally, just in terms of looking out kind of a, at the professional landscape and who, who do I look to as a role model, a peer, or perhaps a, a mentor. Um, I've been very fortunate to have several, uh, people that, that have been kind of formative for me here and there over the years in different ways. I, and I think it's really critical. Uh, for you, especially as an up-and-coming IT professional, you know, I, I spent a lot of time teaching, as you, we all know, because it's all I've talked about for 30 minutes. But uh, in that role, I, I am fortunate in the sense that I get to act as a resource for students. And I really do love teaching, but I love staying in touch with my students equally as much and following up with them and being a resource for them. And I can't stress enough the importance of having a mentor or a peer or a colleague that acts as a influence on you as you move through different stages of your career, helping you to understand the challenges, the roadblocks, but also the ways to be successful and to become better at what you do. And you need to be selective when you pick those people, obviously, because you need people that will be willing to help you. Uh, but it is important to have them. And so I think it's very, very crucial that you can look back on your life and say, I've definitely seen those people and see what they've been able to do for me. Perfect. Yeah. I, and I was looking either way, whether it was personal, professional. So Mm -hmm. You know, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, so I know you, you kind of, with IT Pro TV, you, um, you came in as a guest host before you started there full time. So I, I, yeah, so I mentioned I worked for New Horizons, mm -hmm. um, for 20 years. I left them officially towards the end of last year at the end of 2017. And so I have been associated with <clears throat> IT Pro TV since its inception in one form or another. Uh, I've known uh, Tim and Don uh, for basically the entire time that they 
were involved with New Horizons before uh, IT Pro TV was founded. And I worked with them and, and had done uh, work for uh, them when they were running New Horizons uh, in Gainesville because we were sister centers, essentially. The ownership of both centers were very close. Uh, Gil, the gentleman who set up and, and owns the South Florida and Caribbean franchises for New Horizons, and Tim essentially started out at the same time. So I've known Tim and Don essentially as long as, as I've known him. Uh, and so I've had a very long relationship with them. When they started IT Pro TV uh, and were looking for talent as they brought over their team from New Horizons, uh, I came up and started doing SME, right, subject matter expert kind of guest spot work for them uh, in security and infrastructure, CISSP, System Center, whatever it would have been. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time early on just coming up and dropping in for two or three weeks here or there. Uh, and then over time, as I was getting ready to, to leave New Horizons, uh, it was just a very fortuitous set of conversations and circumstances. And, hey, you're going to be looking to do something. And, hey, we'd like you to come do more of that here. And kind of worked itself out. And I was able to, to be able to come uh, here full time. And so I've been full time since uh, about August or September of 17. So about five, six months at this point now. Awesome. Yep. So mm -hmm. how do you like it there? How do you like IT Pro TV? What, what can what I, can you share? What's what? Give us behind the scenes how you how you and sure how you like sure. It there. So I I love what I do and and where I do it. The people that I work with and work for our IT Pro TV family here, a great uh, group of people. Those of you that have had the opportunity to visit us or to interact with one or more of us on a more you know interactive nature, other than just listening to us kind of one or two dimensional, mm -hmm. right through podcasts and shows and things. I think to a person, you know, you'll hear that we're a pretty fun and cool group of people to spend time with. Uh, it's a great environment, great company, and uh, really just an interesting place to be able to spend your day. We essentially are, uh, you know, a, a modern age, you know, cutting edge technology uh, focused TV production uh, company in the sense that we produce content in multimedia formats, multiple studios, as you are aware and you know, and Maybe when you're here and you'll get the behind the scenes, let me walk around with the camera kind of thing and see some of it firsthand. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting place to work. And we work with technologies and, and deal with issues every day that modern enterprises and IT professionals everywhere in the world have to address. But we also work with technology and deal with issues that you would never see unless you worked in this industry, right? Dealing with all the kind of things that we deal with when you put together, you know, multimedia studios and stream content and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a slightly different environment than I have been used to up until now in the sense that on the IT side, some of the systems we use are things that I've just never really had to spend time with. I'm aware of them, but I've never had to worry about them traditionally. Uh, but with regards to the culture, I, I can't really say enough good things about it. It, it is truly a, just a pretty awesome and incredible place to spend time and work every day. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, I'm definitely jealous of that, and I, I think I've said that to like everybody there. It's a, definitely a really awesome place, you know. And I was, you know, when I, when I was there last year, and this is this is kind of one of like the last things I, I did come to visit last year, and you were there. This was in May of last year, uh, it was 2017. So you must have been coming in for a guest appearance or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing that we talked about in the live stream yesterday. I think briefly touched on, but. Um, I was walking by, I think I was with one of the sales guys or whatever, but I was walking by the studio and it was full glass, you know, the full, you could see in the fishbowl. Yeah. Studio yeah, number one. Yeah, up front. Yeah. yeah. So you could see in perfectly fine. And I look over and there you are just standing there in your socks. And I was like, what, how come he's just standing there in the socks? So what's up with you in the socks? So I'm, I'm actually, you can't see it because I'm, I'm sitting down. You're probably seeing me roughly from about the chest up. But I, if I put my foot all the way up in the camera, you'd see I'm sitting here in my socks now. And so, you know, I just, it, it is, um, so I, I'll tell you a story about how I got to this point in my life where I walk around in socks by, by way of explaining my answer. So you asked about formative people in my life and, and influences and role models. And, and as I mentioned, on my personal side was my grandfather, but I've had several uh, in my professional career. And, and before I turned to IT, uh, when I was in graduate school and doing international relations, political science work, and studying for my, you know, and getting my, my degrees, I had a, a series of just incredible professors um, who really helped shape me and, and helped me to understand a lot of things in the world. And one of them used to walk around in, in college in our graduate seminars in his socks and would just walk around and lecture 
Uh, and that's how he spent his day. He just walked around, he's, you know, I've gotten to the point where I just I can't stand up in shoes all day and I'm comfortable and it's not about what I look like, but about what I have to tell you. And I always, that always stuck with me and I always thought it was such a great way to think about yourself and how you present yourself. Don't get me wrong, it's important to obviously put on uh, a professional appearance and to engage with people in a way that allows them to feel they can engage with you. But I think it, it also allows you to disarm people and makes them feel comfortable. Hey, I walk by, what the heck's he doing in his socks? That's kind of unusual and weird and it stuck with you. And obviously it was something that is memorable. And yeah, I think it makes you just appear more human and approachable. Yeah. And, and you know, if you look at me, look, I'm wacky and different. I mean, how many people do you know that walk around looking like I look like? I trimmed my beard, so you're seeing me in my more professional uh, view. But if you've seen some of the shows we've been doing over the last month, I had a full beard, like, out to yeah. here. I just recently trimmed it. But I got earrings. I got jewelry. I was in the music business for a number of years. I got long hair. I look like your crazy uncle, right, <laughs> who, you know, essentially is that 60s hippie throwback. And so, you know, it's it's just, it's me. It's who I am. Right. It's what I do. I get to come to work, and, and I hang out in a pair of jeans and socks every day. I put on a nice IT Pro logo shirt, and I pull my hair back, and I talk about really cool stuff. Who could possibly not want to do that, and who could possibly want to go do that anywhere else, right? Yeah. Anywhere else, I have to be dressed up. And I spent 20 years dressed up in a shirt and tie, going to meetings and talking to people every day. And I got a wardrobe full of clothing. But you know what? The happiest I've ever been doing what I do is hanging out in my sock. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. That, I've, I've been dying to ask you that question, actually. That's awesome. That's perfect. I, I mean, I completely mm -hmm. respect it. You know, I didn't think there was yeah. anything wrong with it. I was like, that's really cool. Yeah. I Plus, like, I got a really cool sock collection, so I want to yeah. show it off. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen that, like, on, uh, I think, like, Facebook or Twitter or something. They've talked about it before, so. Every so often, yep. Yeah, yep. that's awesome. So, I don't know. I think that's really all I got for you. I don't, like I said, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you have another, uh, like, podcast or something to do, so I greatly. I've got some shows to get back to. We're doing okay. Azure Architecture, so we're in the middle of talking about uh, your site recovery and is your backup right now so i gotta go back and do that okay well, but yeah but it's fun. been it's been such a cool opportunity yeah. thank you so much yeah thank you i appreciate you uh coming on it's awesome and i i'll see you in a couple weeks actually if you're there you you will I certainly you will. i think i i did sign up to uh, spend some time with you while you're here we can grab a cup of coffee and chat awesome. for a bit and that'll be uh, something i'll look forward to Perfect. yeah me too i'm really excited to come down there it's gonna be a great a busy week for me but looking forward to okay it. so very cool all right, you have a great day, and uh, thank you for coming on again, of course. so Thank care. you. All right, thank you, sir.